Welcome to Empowered by Iron, the podcast for female strength athletes by female strength athletes. We are your hosts, Dr. Kristen Lander from Fiercely Fueled Nutrition Coaching and Mary Morton, PhD candidate and weightlifter. Together, we are Empowered by Iron. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Empowered by Iron. This week, we have a very extra special episode for you all. We have our second part of our mental health series. And last time we talked all about depression, and I know that you all really enjoyed and loved that episode. And this time we have some wonderful ladies and a mental health professional who are going to be discussing trauma, what trauma means for them, what their stories are, and how lifting has helped them overcome their trauma. So first and foremost, I'm Mary. I probably won't be talking much during this episode. Um, I'm here to help moderate and do it best I can. We have Kristen. Kristen, say hi. Hey, guys. She is going to help moderate and help uh, contribute as best she can. And we have, uh, well, we have four other ladies, but right now we have three. So I'm going to go through each of them and have them introduce themselves. And uh, we'll get right into it. So kind of, ladies, if you could kind of tell your, a little background of yourself, like what do you do? What's your sport? You don't have to tell us what your trauma is. We know that you're here for that. But just give us a little background and info about who you are and what you're doing here. So let's first start with Shannon. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. First off, I'm Shannon. I'm from Canada. It's kind of um, the east or west coast of Canada, sort of. Um, I am a mental health professional in my province. I'm actually a certified Canadian psychotherapist. I also have um, specialized training in developmental trauma and how trauma is impacting our brain. I am also a lifter. I've done a bodybuilding show. I've done a couple powerlifting meets. I hold a few national records in Canada for bench and squat um, and powerlifting. And yeah, I'm just happy to be here and excited. For you who cannot see Shannon's face, when she said she holds a few national records, there was a little bit of smug, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean for it to be like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love it. No, no, you own it. You own your record. So Shannon, I'm sure they're beat now. <laughs> and whatever. Once a record holder, always a record holder, right? That's how that works. Yes. Yes. So Shannon is our mental health professional. If you didn't gather from her intro. So she'll be helping guiding us in this episode. Next, we have um, one of our OGs, one of our, I don't, I don't know, it's been a while since we've had you on, Anna, but you are, you are a crowd favorite. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm actually really excited to be back on here. I had a really great time with our first podcast, for sure. So that was uh, also a really deep conversation we had on that one, too. <laughs> yeah, we did. Um, uh, so, so yeah, my name is Ana Perez. Um, I'm a competitive power lifter, have a few records here and there. Um, I live in the Washington DC area. Um, really like my, my hope with all of this and just, um, you know, doing these podcasts is to use my platform as a power lifter, just as a means to be an advocate, uh, for those who struggle with adversity and just show them that it's possible to change your mindset and overcome. That's just how I've gotten by in life. So I hope to help others do the same. I think that is why everyone loves you. Hmm. Yeah. Cause... Well, and I Go think ahead, that that's really important to have a platform and not abuse it. And to really, especially in this day and age, to use it for something that's, I mean, really important, such as mental health. Mm-hmm. And then, absolutely. Last and certainly not least, although she's not last, last, We're waiting on one more, um, Leslie. Tell us about you, girl. Hi. So um, I'm Leslie Mulcahy, and I'm 38 years old, live in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So I'm on the opposite side of Canada as Shannon. I'm representing the East Coast. Um, And I have been kind of dabbling in powerlifting for about five years. So got a little bit of a start when I was at a strength and conditioning gym where lifting was just kind of part of the workouts and then um, there's been lots of stops and pauses and breaks along the way uh, to now but essentially I've done five meets and I'm training for my sixth one Um, I might go into competitions but I don't consider myself competitive I just have really done it for goals and focus Um, 
I did set a deadlift record at IPA Worlds a couple of years ago, um, but did not submit the record attempt. Um, so for <laughs> the record, um, so I'm not exactly on the books, but I'm not mad about it either. So yeah, so thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Okay, so this episode is all about mental health in terms of trauma and eventually will lead into how lifting has really helped get you through the traumas you have experienced in your life. But first, we think it's important to unnecessarily define trauma because as we were talking before the episode, um, Shannon agrees there's not really a great definition of trauma. But she did have something really important to say. So I'm going to let Shannon take it away and talk about trauma and what that means to individuals. For sure. Um, So trauma is a very, uh, I don't want to say it's a loose definition. However, it's seen as something that is adversely taken by our person. So if we are living an event and it becomes stressful to the point that our person, so our spirit, our body, our mind um, can't handle it essentially, and it becomes bigger than just stress, it then becomes a certain type of trauma. So trauma can be physical, mental, psychological, spiritual, financial, like it can be a ton of different um, types of trauma. But again, it just kind of depends on how we're taking it as a person. So what I perceive as trauma might not be trauma to say an individual that's going through the same event. It just depends how our, like I said, our person interprets that event in a sense. Well, so what does trauma mean? I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot and have you say something you don't want to say, but what does it mean to you? Maybe not in terms of what your trauma is, but overcoming it I don't know if that made any sense um I think to me um you know with trauma is I think a lot of times if you don't understand that you've had trauma like I grew up for most of my life not even knowing all the things that had happened to me which you know I'm sure I'll get into later um I didn't really know like why all that had happened to me so I think a lot of it at first was often feeling you know, was victimized. And I think for a while, I just kind of fell into that role. And it really wasn't until, you know, I was able to understand what happened when I learned what trauma was and the things that I went through, that I was able to kind of turn that around and went overcome it. So I have a dumb question. Um, As someone who I wouldn't say that I've suffered trauma, um, but so hearing you say when, like when you recognize, when you figured out what trauma was, how did you figure that out? How did you figure out that there's a definition to what you experienced? Uh, it took a long time for me to figure that out. I, it wasn't until I was, I'm 35 years old now. So I think I was around 27 when I went to um, just meet with a therapist. Like I kind of fought it a lot. Like when I was a teenager, um, I didn't really want to, go to go to therapy and because I just you know it's almost like I was in denial and like finally when I just came to terms that I really needed some help I met with a therapist and the first thing she told me she was like you know your textbook PTSD and that kind of to me was like I didn't like being labeled so at first I didn't really like that I even had a kind of diagnosis if that makes sense like it almost made it worse um so that's that's really when I found out about it and at, in a way, it's like I, I started to kind of research more about it, like what is PTSD? Um, and I was able to learn about it through just research and then talking to my therapist some more. And I eventually started to work through it that way. So that's how I first learned about it. Yeah. And I think I actually have that makes me have a question for Shannon. Um, is, is it how common is it for someone to experience a trauma and then not realize until years later, like that this has really been affecting their lives? Because I feel like this is kind of pretty common, right? Does that tend to be kind of the rule and not the exception? 100%. So I actually had this discussion um, with some colleagues and some good friends of mine. We don't really get brought up in a world where we're told even what feelings are. So no one yeah. necessarily teaches us from the time we can comprehend what they're saying that this is how you are when you're happy. This is what sad looks like. This is what mad, angry, and then even those complex feelings. So 
I think beyond that, when we experience trauma, we don't necessarily even know what it is. So it's only normal that we grow up thinking that these big catastrophic events that become trauma aren't trauma. So we think, oh, no, it's just another event in my life because I don't necessarily know what trauma is at this point. So how can I label that event as trauma? Um, So it's not until someone sits us down and like looks at what we've gone through and says, you know what, that may actually be trauma. Maybe that is PTSD. Maybe this is exactly what you're going through. You just didn't know that that's what trauma looked like, or that's what, how trauma impacted you or impacts a person. So it's quite common. Yeah. Very common. Yeah. I want to stop for a second because we now have Lizzie with us. Hey, hey Lizzie. Hey. hey, Lizzie. Um, you didn't miss much, but can okay. you introduce <laughs> yourself to everyone and um, a little bit about you and what your sport is? Sure. Um, so, yeah, my name is Lizzie and I am, oh gosh, um, I'm a PhD student and I run an LGBTQ resource center. Um, I am a sexual assault survivor with PTSD and I am new and just kind of starting to compete in powerlifting. Awesome. Welcome. I'm sorry that I gave you a face, but you said PhD student and maybe if I do have trauma, that's my trauma. Oh yeah. (laughs) Some other unrelated trauma. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Unrelated, but definitely traumatic. Okay. So we were talking a little bit about, um, So Anna was talking about how when she first learned that the feeling she was experiencing and what she was going through actually had a diagnosis um, called trauma. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add to that, if there was a time that you also, like there was a moment where you're like, oh my gosh, there's a definition to what I'm feeling or. Yeah. Um, So I, I kind of, I actually kind of always thought I, probably had PTSD, um, but I wasn't diagnosed. And so for me, it was about when I, when I first started going to therapy, one of the things we talked about was like naming things, right? Naming the things that didn't happen to me and also naming the things that were currently happening to me and to my body. Um, and so I went and got a diagnosis. And I think that for me doing that was actually really, really impactful. So it wasn't even about, um, about just kind of learning that what I had had a name so much as it was about learning that this thing that was happening to me that I was trying to learn how to live with um, had validity. Um, so like I could tell people like, if I was dealing with something like, oh no, it's not just that I'm having a bad day or that I'm just anxious today. I have this thing that happened to me that caused this like recognized disorder um, that I'm receiving treatment for, but also that means that there are, are things that, you know, happen in my life that are going to have an effect on my daily living. Um, so it was really nice just kind of to have that and to have that validity of, like, no, this is real. And some other like mental health professional has told me, yes, you're not, like, you're not imagining this. This thing exists and it's true. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I think that that's helpful too, being able to, to realize that, um, because when someone has PTSD, especially if they've been living with PTSD for a long time, um, and, and it has been kind of like woven its web in your life and affected your relationships and jobs and just different things like that. Um, I think that it's always helpful to go, Oh, that's why I was acting that way. Or that's why I feel this way when this happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I think for me, the the thing that, that made it really necessary that I get the diagnosis was actually the fact that it was affecting my job. Um, so I actually had a flashback at work um, in an instance in which a, like a student had come to me for like advice and help and things like that. And I had a moment of like, okay, I'm, I'm actively trying to do my job and I can't now. And so how do I talk to my supervisors and how do I talk to the people who are supposed to be my support system at work about this if I can't actually vocalize or, or verbalize what's going on. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And I can attest to that as a, as a TA. I mean, I'm not a teacher teacher, but I'm a TA. Some of those things, I don't think that we prepare people of any type of power position to handle that. I 
I know that there's a system in place of what I should do for a student if they come to me. I don't know if it's the right thing to do for that student, but that's terrifying. Like, yeah, I, I wouldn't know what to do if someone came to me with that type of information, you know? For sure. Uh, yeah. And it unfortunately happens to me a lot uh, just because of the nature of the type of work I do. And uh, the first couple of times it happened to me, it, well, it's always terrifying. But, like, the first couple of times I'm like, nope, I'm going to screw this up. I'm going to mess this person's life up. I'm going to do all the wrong things. Um, and I think that coming to terms with my own trauma and, and things like that actually was probably the most effective way or like the most helpful thing that I learned that I could use uh, to work with other people. So I was like, okay, like all I have to do is follow the golden rule. How would I want to be treated in this moment? And and that was that was really really helpful for me too. Yeah, Leslie, what about you? you um, so I I think I've. It sounds like I may have come by my PTSD in a slightly different way. So in May of 2014. Um, I won't go into great detail because it's a long and ridiculous and convoluted story, but um, Listen, essentially you share as much as oh, you no. want. <laughs> no, literally it's like, <laughs> it's so long. It goes on for so long anyway. But the, the crux of it is, is that um, I was at a person's house property to drop off some stuff for a dog rescue and um, two of her dogs, um, started to fight. So it was a pretty violent dog fight. And, um, I was asked by said person to help intervene. And, um, I got bit in the process and uh, so hand, um, so I got bit on my right hand and then essentially that evening goes on and that whole situation went on for quite a while. Um, so I actually had a fracture um in the middle of my hand so initially when this happened like it was I knew it was upsetting and scary and and I could name some of those things um but there were quite a few things that happened that even like my best friend I didn't disclose what happened um and and I wasn't quite sure why I couldn't like I felt a lot of shame and guilt about the situation um and so within a couple of days, like I had to go in for surgery. So I had my first major surgery and I was recovering from that. And then I had to go back to work. And so all of these things were happening. And I just kind of, I think, thought that basically what I was feeling in terms of being, I just thought it was emotional, to be honest. I'm, I'm a pretty emotional person on a good day. So <laughs> um, I really thought that I was just like tired and emotional and like, oh, I was tired from the surgery. And I had to do rehab on my hand and all of that kind of stuff. And so I wasn't, I wasn't completely open, you know, with friends and family really about what I was actually going through and the thoughts that were running through my mind about the incident. Um, and I have a dog. <laughs> um, so like, I remember going to pick him up from the kennel that he'd been at at the time that this happened, which I was really lucky because they kept him for like a week for me. And I went to pick him up and I realized I was actually nervous and it happens to be the same breed mm -hmm. of dog. So, um, which was kind of tough, full disclosure, they are pit bulls, but, um, yeah, so it was, it was really tough for me to realize that suddenly like this dog that I had, who's incredible and is amazing. Um, I've picked him up and I felt nervous about it. And basically, you know, I went back to work pretty quickly. And to what you said about people in power or in positions where we may go to somebody for support and them not knowing what to do, even though I wasn't open about that or at work, I remember somebody who was superior to me saying, you're going to be okay, right? And so like, I was like, yeah, of course. It's I'm not great. really a question. That's like, you're going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of, <laughs> and, and I, and you know, and I, I know this person well, and I actually think they, they meant well, but I didn't actually feel, and it was in a, you know, it was in a boardroom meeting <laughs> and I was just like, it's not like it could be like, no, I actually just closed my office door for two hours and cried. Like I couldn't, I couldn't say that out loud. Um, 
so it, it went on for, I would say, I'm not, I can't remember the exact timeline now, but I basically knew that I knew something was off. Like I, I knew it was beyond being just emotional, but I was still in my head thinking, I just need to go and talk to someone about it. So I made an appointment with a counselor through um, the employee family assistance program at my work. And I'm going to put a plug in for those because if your employer has them, they are free and they offer great services. And for a lot of people, I think it can be a really great first step um, when they are thinking mental health, um, particularly if cost is a barrier. So um, went to see this counselor and um, I, he was like, so what's up? And so I'm, I start telling him and recounting that day and he stopped me and he said, no, you can't go on. I was like, well, this isn't going very well. Um, and he said, you have trauma. And I was like, no, no, I'm just emotional. Like I actually argued with him about the T word. Cause I was like, no, that sounds complicated. Like, <laughs> I just I just want to talk about my feelings and have a good cry and I'll leave the office and I'll be great. And, there, and you know, and to his credit, the reason he stopped me was because he wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to go so far deep into recounting the memories that I could safely leave the office and carry on with my days, which is which I didn't necessarily appreciate the t at the time, but I certainly appreciate it now. Um, so he basically called me out on that and recommended that I. Uh, see a psychologist or somebody who was um, able to treat PTSD through EMDR, which I always mess up, Shannon. That's <laughs> EMDR. Right. It's EMDR, right? It's, it's, yeah, a it's treatment, EMDR. I, ne I never remember what it stands for. I always um, mess it up. Eye movement desensitization, and I always mess it up too because that's not something I actively yeah. use with children. So, right. Yeah. No, <laughs> but so, yes. Yeah. So I, I basically then sought out a a practitioner who specializes in that. And um, so it would have been, I think, July. So from May to July, so it was about two months. So for me, because the PTSD came out of a, you know, an incident or an accident or a, a very particular situation in this case, I guess my timeline to actually getting diagnosed and to getting help um, was potentially a little quicker than some people might experience with PTSD. Um, but it was, it was definitely, I, I didn't understand it at the time. Um, and I, I mean, even now it's four years later and I think I am constantly learning new things about what my trauma means to me, how it manifests, um, how I can name it, how I deal with it, how I see other people dealing with it. Um, so it's, it's definitely, it's been an experience for sure. And even to be comfortable saying that I have PTSD. Like I went from major denial to now I'm like, I feel like I should put it on a t-shirt. Like, or, <laughs> or I should have a business card to hand someone so I don't need to give them the, like, I have PTSD speak. And it's just like, yeah. here, here <laughs> read, read these quick bullet points and, and you're all caught up kind of a deal. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting thing to learn about and in comparison to other mental health um, challenges or conditions and stuff. And, and it's just like from, you know, understanding what triggers are. Yeah. Like, that's a huge one, right? So I often see, and when people talk about, um, so we see a lot in the media in terms of like first responders or, um, people who have served in the forces and, and their experience with trauma. And I, th I think people get that because they're like, oh, like somebody served in a war-torn country and what they would experienced and went through. People give me funny looks when I say I don't want to walk my dog in a dog park. Because <laughs> it doesn't, even though it's kind of obvious if you if you think about it. Yeah. Um, so I often try to explain when people ask me about it is explain like there are really obvious triggers, but I call obvious in terms of like, so the cause of your PTSD and what would be an obvious trigger, right? So if two dogs start fighting, that's a huge issue for me, <laughs> uh, or even the sounds of snarls and things like that. And then there are other odd triggers that might come up or how your anxiety, for example, might manifest. 
um, at some point as a result of what you've gone through. And those are harder ones for people to understand. So, yeah, I think it, it's harder for you to understand about yourself and it's harder for people, your friends and family and loved ones to understand too, I think. And you said something, Leslie, um, a couple of minutes ago about, and I, I think you were alluding to, though I could be mistaken, but I think you were alluding to like how your PTSD affects other people, as I think you made mention of. Did I hear that wrong? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. I'm like, what did okay. I say? Um, well, I, do, I think that that, I think that that's, I mean, anyone, I think that has any sort of mental health battle, um, that's something that they consider, right? Is like, how is what's affecting me affecting those around me? Um, and how I'm managing it and dealing with it and dealing with my triggers or whatever. Um, I think that's just adds another element of, um, potential anxiety for people to manage these kinds of things. And I think it's, Part of it is, you know, um, depending on the situation you're in and who you're having to explain it to, mm-hmm. it's some people, you know, are really going to try and get it. <laughs> and some people are going to brush you off and think like, mm-hmm. oh, they're just flippantly using like PTSD <laughs> as a, you know, <laughs> just throwing out that word like, oh, I'm so traumatized by whatever. And it's like, no, actually I am. <laughs> um And, and, you know, for me, so, um, for me having a dog, so there, there is elements of my PTSD I have to manage every single day. That's, that's where I'm at with it. Right. And and I think all of us have to manage elements of our PTSD every single day. And, and that's, that's part of what I have to manage. So, you know, I get funny looks from other dog owners, (laughs) Um, which, which sounds like really stupid, like who cares? But when I get a funny look from a dog owner who I'm like, Oh, I don't really, I don't feel, um, good today. So I'm, I'm not feeling like I want my dog to greet other dogs because in my head I go to the, what if, like, what could happen? What if they start fighting? What if that owner's a dummy and they don't know how to control their dog? Like I, I go through this whole thing all the time. I'm literally the most judgmental dog walker around. So, <laughs> um, but somehow I end up feeling like guilty about it or I feel ashamed or I'm embarrassed. Like that person just thinks I'm a bitch. Right. Right. Like it's, and yeah. and really in the scheme of things who cares but it's because in that interaction for me all of that thing all of those things come up right and and i'm left you know on the rest of my walk thinking about it um and not necessarily being able to fully control what i am thinking about sometimes does that take me back to that incident in that day absolutely sometimes i i don't go there because i'm very lucky that i've had you know a practitioner who has helped me be able to manage some of that. So I've been able to, she used the term dial down. I've been able to dial down the anxiety in certain scenarios. Some days it's good. Some days it's not so good. So. I feel like you touched on a couple of things, Leslie, that um, are greater than just your own like guilt and being ashamed and embarrassment. I think as a society, we're meant to feel if anyone with mental health should feel guilt and we should feel shame. And that's part of a greater problem. It's not necessarily just like your anxiety around the situation. It's how everyone else is perceiving it and they shouldn't. Because if we walked around with a cast and we didn't necessarily want to do a pull-up in the gym because we're in a full arm cast, we wouldn't get judged. But if we're walking our dog and we're showing anxiety because you've experienced that, that's not something that other people should judge, but we're taking that on ourselves. So a lot of times we call it, it's the invisible illness, right? Mental health is something that majority of us at some point in our lives will deal with, but it's so stigmatized, especially PTSD, um, that we are meant to feel ashamed, right? Society doesn't understand it at this point. So it's us that should be ashamed and guilty, not them for not understanding that we might need a little extra space, right? Those that are dealing with something, we might need a little extra time to delve into that dog walk or to delve into a new relationship 
or to like go to that place that we were traumatized at. Like it, it shouldn't be us that's made to feel guilty. We should have this invisible hug around us trying to help us through it. But instead we get this feeling of we are the in the wrong at this point in time when it shouldn't be like that. Yeah. Do you guys feel as, um, uh, obviously you don't have the experience of being a man, but do you feel as women that you're taken less seriously? Like, oh, she is just being emotional. Oh, just get over it. As, as I'm going to say for, as a professional, um, I see it from both sides. So I see it. Yeah. We do get that as women. I did when I was going through my own trauma stuff, like, yeah, get over it. You're being overly emotional. Um, stop crying. You get all those. But then even from my point, when I work with, cause I work with uh, children under about 21. So I'll get the 10 year old with trauma, whether it be a boy or a girl and don't cry, stop crying. That's not something to cry over. And especially the boys toughen up, be stronger. And it's so hard to like deal with and tell these little kids that have even adults to tell, um, some of my friends and stuff that I help with through stuff um, to tell them at 30 that it's a really okay to cry. Like you are allowed to be emotional, right? Like it, and I think that's universal, not just gender specific. Um, it's okay to feel sad and it's okay to be um, really hurt and upset right now. And I don't think we intuitively know that. Well, for the most part, a lot of us weren't brought up like that. So we don't intuitively know that it's really okay to cry. You're allowed to show emotion. Right. I think that emotions um, make people uncomfortable and people want to remedy the situation immediately. Like, how, uh, let me fix it. Like, how can I fix yeah. it for you? You're, you're sad or upset or mad or, you know, whatever it is, people either want to fix it or like want you to go away until you're yeah. over it. <laughs> you know, like don't, they don't want to be around it. It makes them uncomfortable because it makes them face potentially their own emotions. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No, I actually like when I first started going to therapy, one of the things that I really struggled with was like actually like, having appropriate emotional responses to what I was dealing with. Yeah. And so I would try and hold it all in. And, and so, yeah, Mary, when you asked that, I was just like, no, my problem is actually that I don't show emotion. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it took me a really long time to get to a place where I could do that. That's something I, I still kind of struggle with, but um, I kind of got the opposite response from people, which was I would tell somebody that I was having a hard time or going through something and they would say, no, you seem like you're okay. Uh, and so it was like, well, I'm not. <laughs> right. Lizzie, so I'm actually, issues, but yeah. Yeah. I'm actually, I'm actually in your boat in, in that way in that I uh, don't tend to show much emotion and have um, had instances where I was um, in a therapy session with a mental health professional that told me after I told them, you know, something that happened to me um, that like they went home and cried about it because I obviously like, they're like, there has to be emotion and you show none. And, and that it, I think that that's something um, uh, that is, I think both things happen is that, you know, either people don't, believe that like, oh, you should just get over it. Or they're like, well, no, I, you seem like you're dealing with everything just fine. There's, yeah. you have no emotion over this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of um, my understanding is that's maybe part of kind of the um, protection mechanism, mm -hmm. the protective mechanism that we have. Um, it's like, no, I'm okay. And I think especially because all of you are lifters. And I think that that may be something too, that as lifters, we kind of are like, no, I'm tough. Like I got this. Yeah. I don't, I'm okay. For yeah. sure. And I think you bring up a good point. Like it is such a protective factor for our brain to go into protection mode. Like that's, we are born to fight, flight, or freeze. And that's essentially protective factors. So if we're going through something and um, our emotional brain is saying, no, don't go there. This is not going to be comfortable. It's not a safe place right now. We shut off that part of our brain. We essentially can't work our way up there. So our fight, flight, freeze portion kicks in and we either just shut down or we begin to intellectualize everything. So no, no, I'm okay. I get through my everyday stuff. Really, I'm fine. I don't need to cry about this. I don't need to show emotion. When in fact, that's not at all true. <laughs> we are just protecting ourselves from going there. 
So this podcast is obviously all about how you all have used lifting to either, I won't say overcome your trauma, but to help deal with trauma. Can each of you kind of tell us your your story of how you got into lifting, why you got into lifting, and how that's helped you um, deal with your your trauma? And feel free to chime in. Um, I got into, <laughs> I, I got into lifting, um, because, because of my PTSD, actually what everyone was just talking about in the last few minutes, I'm just sitting here, just like nodding my head. Like I really, for once in this group, we're talking and I don't feel like crazy. I don't feel alone because like all of those, uh, issues that everyone has mentioned about feeling shut down and not knowing how to process emotion. That's really how I've grown up my entire life since day one. Like, you know, from the very beginning, I was born into, into this with my biological mother being a drug addict and I was born addicted to drugs. And so I've really had to battle that throughout my whole life. Um, you know, I ended up turning to drugs when I was 12 years old, um, shutting down my emotions. I didn't know how to process anything. And, after learning that I had PTSD, that's when it all made sense was, you know, why, when the drugs came into my life is because I didn't know how to process anything. I was really just closed off and isolated in every way possible, basically feeling like I was dead inside. <laughs> so when I got into lifting, I like to say that lifting found me, you know, it was just one of the, a point in my life where I was pretty much ready to just end it all. You know, I, was in a really bad place and I came across strength training and it was just something about it that was very it just gave it made me feel like I had some kind of purpose like there's so many feelings that I had going on that I didn't know how to process I didn't have the words to process them but there was just something about the feeling that I got from lifting and when I started to get strong um that I feel like having to be strong and um just kind of carry myself through life and be mentally strong and shut down essentially sort of prepared me for, you know, getting under the bar, like powerlifting. It just gave me this mindset, this mentality that no matter how hard or difficult it was going to be, that I was going to do it. And to actually have something that I could show for with lifting um, and, and being su a successful lifter now, um, I just think that it's just really done so much for me. Um, just to kind of help me process things without really needing the words to do it, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think that there is, um, I know that there's a lot of research out there on um, like repetitive movements being helpful for processing trauma. Um, and I believe that there's some research now coming out on lifting um like lifting heavy weights i don't know if shannon if you know of any of that out there but um or what i'm talking about <laughs> no i for sure yeah, do i i actually wrote my um, thesis in my master's on how nutrition and physical education can help um drug treatment abuse outcomes like when they go to treatment um if we implement that into their treatment planning how it's going to help um and then further than that after i finished when i got into the brain development and trauma portion of my career um, had that repetitive movement so what happens in your brain so I'll go all nerd for a minute so our brain essentially when we get stuck in that fight or flight or freeze so our trauma stressors and our anxiety um, it doesn't the brain needs like a clear line to get up into the cognitive thinking portion and we get stuck in that bottom one it can't move so there our neurons can't essentially go up so the reason that repetitive movement movements work is it's helping our brain re-regulate so regulation is essentially our heartbeat. So if we can get our body and our brain in sync with the repetitive movements, so kind of like tapping, or if we can do like some meditation and like chanting in our mind, that helps our brain start re-regulating. So it gets out of that fight, flight, or freeze and cre can create that line back up into our cognitive portion. So those that's how the repetitive movements help. And yeah, this heavy lifting stuff, I'm actually getting some training on that as well right now. I haven't delved into the research too much yet, but yeah, there's going to be some interesting things coming out with that lately. So, yeah. so Anna, there is like scientific proof that, um, <laughs> lifting did 
has helped you. I mean, you know that, right? Like we don't need yeah. scientific evidence, but it's there. I mean, um, honestly, I, I didn't go, I didn't go to treatment or do anything yeah. like that when I was trying to, you know, get clean. I just, I literally got clean. Honestly, you know, one rep at a time, I just kept going to the gym. I just kept showing up and it just, that that's what I just kept doing. And it really changed so much just in my head. I just got confident and all these feelings, you know, I was actually learning how to process my feelings too. So it did a lot for me mentally, you know, in addition to just becoming physically strong, it was, I say it was more of a mental shift that happened when I really pursued the strength training. Well, and you are 100% describing um, how Empowered by Iron, the podcast came to be, um, that this is a conversation that Mary and I had um, while hiking in the upstate of South Carolina one day was um, how how lifting transforms women and not not just their bodies. I mean, we know, yes, that happens, but um, the mental transformation that takes place and the confidence that women build and the things that women realize that they can overcome just based, just based on lifting heavy weight and, and hitting a PR or doing something that they didn't even know they were capable of doing, or, you know, there's a million examples, but um, that is exactly um what happens with women. That's what we want to showcase on this podcast. But Anna, you also said something that um, I really, I re really spoke to me and that you said that this is like one of the first times talking about this, that you haven't felt alone. And that again is why we're here because I think our, our stories have power. And um, I know that just hearing people out there are going to be listening to this and go, Oh my gosh, I am not alone. And I think that that is such a powerful thing to realize that other people go through this um, and that they're going to be okay. And that there is hope and um, the people are able to um, lead successful lives. So. And I think it too, when I was talking, sorry, um, about my thesis, you guys both touched on something really important. When I did my research, a lot of what comes from it is that confidence and that confidence gives us, gives us the drive to not want to fall back. And it gives us a new social outlet. And then you find a new um, place where you find friends and people that are like-minded and it almost becomes this new sense of security. So I don't want to go back to the old drug addicted me. I don't want to go back to the old hurt me or the old sad me. I want to strive to continue this new um, confident person that I'm becoming. And now I have this social group that I have to be accountable for or held accountable to and accountable to myself type thing. So it's, it gives it's so much to the mind. It's wonderful. It's such a good lifestyle. Yeah, that's really true because I really, prior to all of this was a loner, an outcast, isolated myself from everyone. And I'm the complete opposite now. Now I'm like traveling everywhere. I have all these friends. I mean, I, I never would have had the courage to go and reach out to people and make friends and get on a platform and compete in front of, you know, hundreds of people or on a live stream. Like I would never have been able to do that before all of this. So, I mean, I really, the transformation that's happened in my brain has just been like night and day. For me, uh, before I started lifting, I actually did a lot of like medium and long distance running. Um, and I, I probably always hated running, but I told myself that I liked it because I wanted to be like the kind of person that did that, but also because I thought that running was the thing that was going to make me skinny. Um, and so I was like, yeah, if I can just like force myself to run far enough, long enough, often enough, I'll just be skinny and that'll be the way it is. Because I would see people who are really good distance runners and that's what their body looked like. Um, and then my PTSD got to the point where I didn't feel safe on like long runs outside um, and uh, and running actually became a trigger for me. And so I was like, okay, well, I can't do this anymore. Um, so I've got to do something else to manage my body size. Um, and so I ended up at the gym, like on the cardio machines and it was terrible. And one day I just kind of walked over to the weight section and I was like, maybe, like, maybe I'll just lift some weights for a little while. Um, and it kind of started there and I was like, this actually doesn't suck. Like, 
being on the elliptical for an hour and a half sucks, but like uh, dumbbell presses aren't that bad. And so I, I started lifting weights in that way. And I found that not only did I not hate that, but that like having the, like having the progression there was a really wonderful way of establishing like something that I can do every day that I could, that I could accomplish that I could control. Um, and so it was really nice to be like, okay, I can't control the way that I feel and I can't control so many of these other things that happened to me and so many of these other things that have happened to my body, but like I can go to the gym and I can lift more today than I lifted yesterday. Um, and so it, it kind of started as that. And then it became a way in which I felt, I started to develop deeper, uh, feeling better about taking up space, particularly in masculine dominated spaces. Um, and, and kind of being myself and being, um, present and feeling powerful in those spaces. And so it did a lot for me in terms of just kind of like taking back control of my body, but also, um, taking back like a, a, a self sense of, of power and belonging. Um, and yeah. I think that that you, you said something that I think is just so important that I want to just um, retouch on that. You said that it helped you feel um, present and more powerful in the space that you're taking up, which mm-hmm. I think is so important. And um, I think for women and, and anyone who's experienced some sort of trauma is that um there's a tendency to feel small and to not want to take up space and not want to be seen. Um, And so to hear you say that you feel powerful in the space that you take up is huge. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it was, yeah, it was a big deal for me and it was also wonderful because I don't know, it gave me the confidence to feel comfortable being able to say things like, um, I like my body better when it's strong. And so whatever it looks like when it's strong is the way it's going to look because I want it to be strong. Um, but also feeling comfortable being in that space. And being like, yeah, I'm not, like, I'm not trying to have a body type that the rest of the people and like the rest of like a lot of the women in the gym are trying to have. And I don't care if anybody else likes my body. Um, yeah. It's really, really important. So. That's yeah, a very I think powerful that that's message. That's a hard, that's a hard place to get, especially, um, a lot of women go through, if not trauma, it's uh, it's some type of eating disorder or body dysmorphia. So getting to a point, and I, you know, for me, weights have got me there. I mean, without that, I did the same thing you did, Lizzie. I ran until basically my knees said, you can't run anymore. And then I decided to do cardio until I couldn't do cardio anymore. And then finally, it was all, all that's left is weights. But then once that happened, you get that confidence and Kristen will attest to this at the gym. No one will come and talk to me because I just like to think that I exude confidence, but I think I've gotten to the point where people know that they can't mess with me. I mean, I'm not going to sit there and listen to your bullshit about what you think my body should look like or, you know, how do you get so swole? Like, dude, I'm not here for that bullshit. Like, you go take up someone else's time with that. But I think that the weights are very, I wouldn't be here without lifting. Leslie? Um, <laughs> so, um, so my incident, accident, event, whatever, I, I always change the name, but I never know what to call it. But um, it happened like just after I'd basically completed six months at this strength and conditioning gym that I've been at. So I was feeling really amazing. I had lost weight, which is not the moral of this story, but as somebody who has, you know, dealt with um, body weight issues and body image issues and stuff like that, um, it wasn't, my body image had changed in a really positive way um, from, from what I was doing. I felt really strong and great and just awesome. And then suddenly I had this hand that was out of commission, so I couldn't go back to the gym. And I, and I, I, I didn't have that outlet that had become like just a really um, powerful, important thing in my life. Um, Of course, at some point the hand healed and um, 
but I think I kind of lost my drive for it in terms of um, dealing with the PTSD. Um, so I was basically at the gym for about a year. Um, I will say I did take up jogging <laughs> with the dog, but nowhere near as passionate about running as you guys were at some point. So, um, but just to, to try and keep active and try to keep some of those good things happening in my body. Um, my eating went out the door. Like I actually remember the night that it happened and I'd been just basically doing like really like clean, healthy, good fuel eating. And um, that night uh, my friend brought me to the pharmacy to get my prescription for that weekend. And I bought like jujubes and like sour cream and onion chips or something. And I remember <laughs> him looking at me and being like, whoa, but like my body was suddenly like craving it. It was, it was really weird. And, but my eating went downhill kind of after that, like I was emotionally, I was, I didn't have a good appetite. I didn't really want to eat anything good. But when I was eating, it was something that I probably like, that wasn't really going to help me out <laughs> Put it that way from a, a good perspective. So my, my nutrition went all off track. My sleep went to hell. Um, my drive to want to do anything. And um, I wasn't sure if I should say this, but I mean, I, I think the reality is it happens um, for people in trauma, but like any sexual interest and drive also went out the door, which was a really hard one to admit as well. Um, and so, yeah, so then I like started processing this stuff and going to treatment and everything. And um, it was about a year later, I kind of got back into the gym and then I moved. So I was living in a more rural area of Nova Scotia at the time and things with jobs and work were changing. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to go back to Halifax. Now. This is great. And I moved back and suddenly I was met with like all of these other <laughs> stressors and unexpected triggers and things that I didn't have to deal with, with um, where I was living. So I just, it was, it was, I basically like cried the first week I moved back to the city like a friend came over and they're like oh like I want to see your new place and they come in and I'm just like bawling <laughs> they're like what's going on because I was I was so stressed out and I wasn't expecting it so I don't know if I was naive about it or what but anyway so um friends of mine were doing a powerlifting meet and they were like you should do it and I was like yeah whatever and then I got in on the waiting list and so I gave myself two and a half months to train for my first powerlifting meet. And so I was so stressed and my triggers were so high. My anxiety was really high. But for two and a half months, five, six days a week, I went to the gym and I trained. And that's basically what I did <laughs> for those two and a half months. Um, went to the meet, had a really good experience, loved it. And then I had the like little drop after a meet. Um, that I know a lot of lifters have the like, what next? What do I do now? And I had that and I kind of felt a little bit lost. And I basically, um, that following winter, I had a few situations that were highly triggering for me. And I kind of, I use the word spiral. Um, when my, when I feel like my PTSD is kind of putting me a bit backwards. Um, and so I didn't, I didn't go to the gym for eight months. And then I got the, oh, I haven't been to the gym in eight months, shame. <laughs> it's a vicious cycle, guys. Um, and I actually, I took the day off work to go back to the gym. I like, because I, I had a theory. I was like, I'm going to go in the middle of the week. And there's not many people around in the middle of the day so that I can just go in. Because I basically... You know, and I think that this is true for anybody who gets out of really like out of, um, you know, their sport or their activity that they're into um, that we are like, oh, it's going to be so hard to get back into it. Or it's going to be so embarrassing to go and have to lift really light weights or like I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be out of breath on the treadmill, whatever it is. So I actually took a day off work and I went back to the gym and I started lifting. And so that kind of turned and then I was like okay I really want to lift like this is what I want to focus on so I got connected with somebody who could do coaching for me I found another gym that was really lifting focused um I found people who were into it and then you know 
did four meets last year, which was really about goals. Um, and it's definitely, I mean, I think there's one, it's, it's a healthy thing to focus on ideally, um, and, and to put our energy into, um, and it's also about making those connections. And I know, um, Sam Beliveau was on the previous, um, episode that you guys did about depression. Yeah. And I know she talked about connecting with people. Um, and it just, you, you build a different community with folks. Right. Um, and, and certainly not that, um, you know, you walk in, you're like, I have PTSD and I'm lifting, but eventually some of that stuff comes out. Like I, I have a crew of people who I live with now and recent experiences where shit went sideways. Um, I was like testing my squat, uh, like at the end of June with a new coach programmer. So the first time like lifting with him, and the night before, I was like walking my dog in my neighborhood and a dog came out of a house and charged at us. And like that was a like two out of van crying for three hours, like not eating kind of night <laughs> and waking up the next day. And I was like, I don't I didn't know if I should go to the gym. I wasn't sure that I should test. Squat is also my nemesis. So I'm like, was worried enough as is. Um, and so I like I messaged. I messaged him and I just said, like, if I come into the gym today, if I walk away from the bar, just don't question me and don't judge my commitment to lifting because I just, I don't know if I can handle it. Um, I was lucky that that day I went in, I was surrounded by some really good people and, and gym partners who I trust. So I ended up walking out of the gym feeling really, really good. Um, so it has I kind of refer to it as like one of the pills I take to deal with my PTSD, to be honest. It's yeah, it's just, and feeling strong and confident to what uh, both Anna and Lizzie said, like that confidence. Cause I, I think, I think we lose confidence in a lot of ways when we're dealing with trauma. Um, and I know I really have. And so having this like parallel universe in my lifting where suddenly I'm feeling good about my body not because of weight loss or weight gain or anything like that. I'm just feeling really strong and confident. I think that translates to when we are trying to process these feelings and these emotions and these triggers that we're going through. So it's, it's just, it's, it's been a really nice compliment. Yeah. I think that um, you really touched on the community aspect of lifting, which I think is, is one that um, we've not really talked a whole lot about before in terms of mental health, but it is, it is, you, you, even if your lifting buddies can't completely understand or have not been through what you've been through, I think that there's this bond that we have with our friends that like lifting and because I think it means a little something different to everyone and everyone kind of knows that, um, that there's this, this community there and that that in and of itself, having the community is really important in healing, but also the, the confidence in going, you know what, I've got through really hard workouts. I'm going to get through this really bad night that I am having. And it's, um, and I think, um, you know, it's been mentioned about the relationship between like coach and athlete or a lifter and their gym partners. And I think that like, regardless of whether or not you have a diagnosis <laughs> for mental health, uh, or for, you know, a mental health condition or whatnot, to be able to walk in and say, like, I've had a shitty day, like, yeah. that's okay. Right. If and, um, you know, to your point about <laughs> if someone had a broken leg, you wouldn't necessarily expect them to do something in the gym in the same way. If you've had a really crappy day, it's OK to let your coach or whoever is spotting you that maybe you're not quite as focused today and whatnot. And quite frankly, if you get a poor reaction back from somebody, I would say cut them out like it's not in, in the same way, you know. If, if you break something and the, and the physical ailments that we openly talk about in sports and in powerlifting, um, I really think we need to start treating the mental health aspect in the same way. Um, and ideally, you will be surrounded by people who are supportive and at least willing, you know, to learn and, and to figure out how they can support you with that. And, and hopefully we can all do the same. 
Yeah, that's a really good point, right? You don't it, you don't want a coach who's going to um, question your commitment if you're not squatting with a broken leg. So why would you want a coach who's going to question your commitment if you are dealing with some PTSD triggers that um, you can't really lift today or you need to change your programming up. Maybe you don't test your one rep max squat because squat freaks you out and you're already having a bad day. <laughs> yeah. Right. I've been known to cry in between sets before. It's just a thing, right? It's like, if it happens, it happens. <laughs> <laughs> when we had Kate Hart on, she said the exact same thing. So <laughs> I think I'm going to touch on a couple of things. So um, as a trauma survivor as well, I think um, for myself, the lifting, I'm a sexual abuse survivor amongst other things. So for me in my twenties, my teens, my twenties, and even my early thirties, a lot of it lifting was about um, being in control of my body. And we kind of touched on that. Um, And for a lot of my years, I didn't want to be attractive. So it was kind of a protective factor, right? Like, this had happened, this trauma had happened to me. So I don't want the opposite sex to look at me as desirable. Um, and then when I did bodybuilding and I'm not knocking bodybuilding, but it kind of gave me this false sense of you look really good when you're really tiny. So stay that way. And not that that's a negative thing. I mean, it's completely sustainable, but for me, it was something so negative. And then when I got into the strength side of things, I again became more in control of my body. And I was like, yeah, you know what? I can be strong and a bit bigger, and it's still beautiful, and that's okay. And I'm my own desirable. I don't need to be desirable to the opposite sex, to the same sex. It's about who I am, and working through my own trauma, and then finding lifting along the way somewhere. um, It more became about being present and powerful and who I am as a person, not who I am in my trauma. Um, So a lot of how I deal with trauma too is And I do this with a lot of my clients as well as I externalize it. Like, sure, I've been through trauma, but trauma is not me. That's not who I am as a person. I'm still me. That has happened to me, but it's not my entire being. It doesn't have to be everything that I am. So speaking on kind of how lifting has helped me through that, I can be in the gym and be extremely mindful under the bar or holding the bar or whatever I'm doing. And I can be one with the bar, but it's also taught me going through my trauma that I, that's not everything that I am. I am not just a power lifter. I am not just a trauma survivor. I'm not just a gym goer. I'm my own person. This is something that I do on the side. This is something that is part of my life, but it's not everything that I am. Yeah. Well, I think that that is important to, um, and Mary and I have talked about this on the podcast before is um, who who are you if you aren't a strength athlete and right. making sure that you are still someone, you're still you if something mm-hmm. happens and you can no longer be a strength athlete, you know, and I think that that's a, that is, that is a really good way to look at it too, because that can get into some dangerous territory. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not having a single thing define you. Right. You really, sh- I don't want to say you should be, but most people are multidimensional. And I think when we let one thing define us, it gets us into a dark place that we don't want to be or in a space that we shouldn't be. And I think taking that back to trauma and PTSD, a lot of times um, when individuals suffer from PTSD, they think that is their diagnosis. That is who they now are. They are PTSD. And it's really hard to get out of that. It takes a lot of work to externalize that because it feels like it's your whole being. It takes over your whole being until um, you can start dealing with some of those emotions surrounding it. But it feels like when you're in the thick of it, this is everything that I am. This takes over every part of my life. And it feels like this is all I have. And it's um, dilapidating in a sense. So it's really hard to get out of that. So just like we need to be this multi- faceted individual. Um, again, when we take it to the trauma piece, it's really hard to come out of I am PTSD, right? It takes a lot of work to get from that PTSD diagnosis to know I'm still an individual. This is just a trauma event that's occurred to me that I'm now working through. Yeah. 
Well, I guess we can kind of wrap this up with the with the final question, and that is knowing where you are now and that everything's oh okay, and that you've you've kind of I mean wherever you're at. Um, looking back on the person who you were before this, or maybe someone who is also suffering trauma through trauma, what advice would you have for them? going forward you know how did is maybe something you a trick you found or some method that you use what would an advice you could give to someone or maybe the younger version of you knowing what you know now i think for me the biggest um, piece of advice if i could go back is um or to anyone out there is um not to isolate yourself You know, that was the biggest thing that I did was I isolated myself for so long and I let all of those things um, kind of fester and they they started to become, you know, into uh, they started to turn into other things like leading me into drug addiction and everything else. And I think that me isolating myself was probably the worst thing that I could have done. So for anyone that's out there, I would just really highly recommend that you talk to somebody like talking to someone doesn't even have to be a a health professional, just anyone. I mean, you have a friend, anyone that you can just talk to, that goes a long way. So um, I think that would be the biggest uh, advice I would give. I agree. It goes back to that community where your community doesn't have to be hundreds of people, but it could be just that one person that you know you can talk to when you really need to. And I think I'll touch on that for a second. Sorry for like, not that long. I mean, it doesn't have to be a person in the beginning when we're in an isolation moment. It can be a dog. It can be a journal. It can be a teddy bear. It can be whatever. Mm-hmm. Just get it out. Just don't let it fester. Get it out. Yeah. And eventually you're going to grow some confidence and you're going to want to talk about it with an actual live person. And it might take time to get there, but you'll get there. Just get it. Don't let it sit there. Get it out. Definitely. No, and I'll I'll definitely say like my dog Tilly has certainly gotten an earful. <laughs> <laughs> she she knows all the tea, but uh, yeah, I think uh, for me, I I kind of have uh, two pieces. So um, one of the things that was really important for me to kind of get over, and I wish somebody had. Um, well, people did tell me this, but I, I wish I believed them when they did. Um, so it's the like if you need medication, there's no shame in mm-hmm. taking your medicine. Um, because I think that that was definitely a thing for me. Um, it took me a long time to get to a place where I was comfortable and not ashamed to say that like, I need help with my anxiety in a way that like just kind of talking to somebody and meditation and all of those things uh, can't, can't help. Um, and so number one is certainly like there's, there's nothing wrong with needing to take medicine. Um, but my other big one is just to like find the things that you do every day that make you feel better, that help with anxiety and to invest in taking that time for yourself, like recognize that as a priority along with work and all of the different things that you have to do, taking care of yourself, your mental health, your body is just as important as all of those things too. Um, Everything Anna and Lizzie just said, (laughs) for sure. Um, I think that, you know, in thinking about lifting, like progression in lifting is not always a straight line. The numbers don't always keep going up, right? And we can't expect that they always will. Um, And I think for me, what I've learned about my trauma is that it's kind of the same way which is really frustrating and hard. So it's it's hard when, you know, for a couple of years, it's, it's a lot of hard work and it's really taxing and it sucks, but you feel like you're making progress. And then you have a situation that is really triggering and really deep. And it, I hate to use the word setback, but that's what it feels like. Like you feel like you're going backwards, um, but that's the reality of it. And, and that can be the experience with PTSD. And so I've kind of gotten to a place with it where I understand that that is part of the reality of what I'm managing and what I'm dealing with. 
but I know the progress can be made. Right. Like I, I know I know where I was and where on the daily I felt like I was being swallowed whole and I couldn't wear mascara. Um, and it's <laughs> a true story. Two months straight. I did not wear mascara to work. It was too risky. Um, but and to that that you can you can come out of that. And just, you know, for me in the past, um, like eight or nine months, I've had two situations that have deeply impacted me in a way that I think I wasn't expecting. Um, And so to your point about medication, there is no shame in it. And actually, I've just, I'll say it, I've um, just made the decision with advice from um, both my doctor and my psychologist to actually go on an anti, um, an anti-anxiety medication daily, which is something I haven't done um, since this incident. So there was part, like I thought about it for a long time. <laughs> um, and, uh, to feel comfortable with that decision. Um, but the reality is, is that the progress again, it, it does, you don't just always keep going forward. And sometimes you do come back a little bit and it's the right decision for me at this point, mm-hmm. um, with my PTSD and where I'm at. So yeah, I think, I think to get some comfort with that, um, But, you know, not to give up hope and to allow yourself to have those feelings and to acknowledge what you're going through and to not compare. I did this a lot in the beginning, and actually, I think sometimes I still do. (laughs) Um, But not to compare your trauma. Sorry, God. Thank God we can't see ugly crying on the podcast, right? (laughs) Um, But to not compare your trauma or diminish what you went through because you don't think it measures up to someone else's experience and what they went through. Um, because I've gone through so many times where I'm like, this is ridiculous, Leslie. Like, get it together. Like, this, you you shouldn't, even though I know if someone told me the full story <laughs> of what I went through, I'd be like, shit, yeah, I get it. Um, but I've done it to myself where I've diminished it. So don't... Um, Understand that your experience has value and it's valid, and um, and to just keep going. Mm-hmm. Shannon, any parting words? Um, yeah, similar to what these ladies have said. Um, I also think it's really important to remember it's not always going to be super shitty. Um, I know a lot of times in like the thick of a trauma or the thick of any mental health. Um, as big as small as we interpret it, it has its shitty moments, but it isn't always going to be shitty. It gets better. And like Leslie said, it goes up and down and it's a roller coaster and don't isolate yourself as much as you want to and um, talk it out. But I promise it won't always be shitty. It gets better eventually, whether it takes days or months or years, it gets better. Just like you're lifting. Yeah, it gets better. (laughs) It won't always be shitty. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, thank you ladies so much for taking the time to to share and discuss. We know that a lot of women listening will really take this to heart. Before we go, though, if you could tell, uh, give your social media handles so everyone can follow you. So Shannon, where can people find you? Um, so my Instagram handle is at Jack Lust. So J-A-C-K-L-U-S-T. Um, it's a mix of kind of my personal life and a little bit of my lifting life. It's kind of a... Um, grab bag of everything but feel free to message and i'm happy to talk to anybody about anything sweet my dear anna Uh, my instagram handle is at uh, at anna smash so a n a -A smash Smash. (laughs) (laughs) leslie where can people find you i'm at leslie rages against uh so l-e-s-l-e-y rages against sweet and Lizzie. Um, I'm at Lizzie Get Strong. So L I Z Z I E Get Strong. And all of this will be linked in the description below. So thank you again so much, ladies.